It's a real honor to be here and a little daunting as well, but I'm excited to have the opportunity to tell you about our work at the interface of, sorry, my laser pointer, of solid state NMR, X-ray diffraction, and first principles computational chemistry, an area that is often referred to as NMR crystallography and has application across the chemical sciences, from material science to structural biology. Now, this talk is meant to have a tutorial focus, so you'll forgive me if every once in a while I take a deep dive into some of the foundational components of NMR crystallography. But before I do, it's nice to be in an environment where I don't have to justify having NMR and crystallography in the same title. And of course, when we do this, uh, what we're indicating is that we're going to use NMR to study structure and the arrangement of atoms and crystals. And clearly this is something that NMR has been doing uh, since its earliest days uh, and the beginning of solid state NMR. Now NMR complements diffraction um, in several ways. You know, diffraction methods are great when there's long range order. It can define that long range order. Whereas NMR is very sensitive to the local chemical structure. And so the combination of the two can give these absolutely beautiful, chemically detailed crystal structures. And that's where I would claim we'll find the insight into the relationship between structure dynamics, reactivity, and function. Now, the sophistication with which solid state NMR diffraction methods um, could be combined took a remarkable leap forward when the two were paired with first principles computational chemistry, uh, which David Grant did in this foundational paper in 1993. And although at the time they were just refining the crystal symmetry of naphthalene, uh, David makes this rather prescient statement in the last paragraph where he predicts how useful this approach might also be to biomolecular systems where you could use isotopic enrichment to focus on enzyme active sites. And so today, inspired by uh, David's work, I want to discuss the tools of NMR crystallography um, by way of two applications. The first is to material science and photomechanical materials. And the second, uh, if I leave myself some time, will be to structural biology and enzyme active sites. And as promised along the way, I'll offer uh, some comments on tools for NMR crystallography and maybe a few strong opinions. Uh, in particular, I'll discuss first principles calculations, the choice of functionals, and the requirement for a priori linear rescaling. Uh, I'll give an introduction to statistics and why R squared is not applicable to hypothesis testing. Um, I'll highlight our program tensor view for visualizing tensor interactions on the molecular framework. And I'll point out quickly some potential uh, tripping points um, for uh, due to inconsistencies in the literature regarding how tensor rotations are handled in spherical tensor form. But none of this makes any sense without context. So let's just jump into the first project that I'd like to discuss, which is centered on photomechanical materials. And this work is part of a larger collaboration at UC Riverside that we loosely call the Photomechanical Materials Group. It includes my group uh, in NMR and NMR crystallography, Greg Barron's group in theory and computational chemistry, and Chris Bardeen's group in solid state photochemistry. Photomechanical materials respond to light by moving. They can, um, they can twist, they can curl, and they can stretch. And in other words, um, they turn photons into mechanical work. And the goal of this project is to understand the atomic level basis for these macroscopic responses. And in particular today, I wanna to tell you about these nine terputal anthracene ester nanorods. Uh, these are 200 nanometer by 60 micron nanorods. They're single crystalline, according to TEM. And luckily for us, they just self-organize in anodic aluminum oxide templates. In other words, they just crystallize into these long uh, single crystals. If you shine light on them, they expand by a remarkable 8%. And the underlying uh, chemistry is the four plus four photodimerization. 
And I know that if I carry out this reaction in solution, these terputyl ester groups swing out. And I know this because I can run it in solution and then crystallize the product and characterize it with single crystal X-ray diffraction. But unfortunately, in the solid state where we see uh, these expansions, we don't actually know what the molecular geometry is or what the crystal packing is. Um, and the reason that we don't know is that when we irradiate these single crystals of the bulk material, they shatter. And so single crystal X-ray is out. What I do know is that the structure of this solid state reacted dimer, this thing that expands, is different than the structure of the solution grown dimer and the monomer. And I know that because it has a unique carbon 13 um, spectrum. So the challenge then in Mark crystallography is going to be to identify and characterize the crystal structure of this solid state reacted dimer. And by doing so, hopefully provide a rationale for the photomechanical response. And so this is actually the first requirement for NMR crystallography. You have to have a good problem, right? You have to have something that's important to solve and that you can't solve with other methods. And the approach we're taking, again, is this NMR crystallography combination of solid state NMR, in this case, powder X-ray diffraction and computational chemistry. In this case, it's gonna take all three to determine the crystal structure, but it can be done. And then armed with that knowledge um, of the crystal structure, we'll hopefully be in a position to understand the mechanism of expansion. And as you'll see, we'll actually have to make laboratory frame measurements of the orientation of these crystal unit cells within the nanorods. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, we don't have single crystals, but we have powdered crystals. Uh, so we can do powder X-ray diffraction and uh, try to solve the structure that way. And we do that using a fairly straightforward approach and a suite of programs within Material Studio. We start by indexing the powder pattern, uh, followed by poly refinement of the candidate uh, unit cells. Next, we introduce and optimize the molecular contents, and then we perform successively finer uh, geometry optimizations, including refeld refinement, uh, solid state DFT calculations. And then finally, um, at the end, we have candidates, and we will um, calculate their powder X-ray diffractions and then compare those to the experimental and rank them based on the weighted residuals. And when we do this, it allows us to identify eight candidate crystal structures for this solid state reacted dimer that are consistent with the powder X-ray diffraction. And they're all members of the orthorhombic crystal system and they're labeled by their space groups up here. And they fall, well, they all have equivalent unicell dimensions as you would expect if they're going to satisfy the powder X-ray and they fall into, uh, into roughly two sets of nearly overlap structures. There's those with small torsions that are similar to the monomer crystals. So small torsions for these terputyl ester groups, they're rotated inwards, just like we see in the monomer crystal. And then there are structures with a large asymmetry in which one of these terputyl ester groups has rotated past 90 degrees, uh, similar to the orientation observed in the solution grown dimer. So this isn't a final answer, uh, but it is progress. And we've actually reached uh, requirement two for NMR crystallography. We have candidate structures. Now, this is a place in NMR crystallography where there's a lot of variability uh, and a lot of different approaches to getting those crystal uh, candidate structures, right? Here, we're using powder diffraction and refeld refinement. That's very, that's very similar to what a lot of groups do, but it's also possible to come up with candidate structures using crystal structure prediction and polymorph uh, prediction. Lyndon Emsley's, Emsley's group has done a lot of that. Uh, there's ab initio random structure searching. Uh, Picard has done a lot of that. Uh, and then there's using powder NMR structural restraints, right? Spin diffusion uh, or through bond connectivity. And 
how you pick those really, you know, is very problem specific. So I would refer folks to this uh, wonderful compendium by Harris, Wazilishan, and Dewar on NMR crystallography to see how folks in the field uh, come up with these candidate structures. Okay, so again, um, we have two sets. Um, so it's progress. But how are we going to distinguish these structures, or at least these two sets of you know, nearly equivalent structures? And for that, we'll turn to solid state NMR and computational chemistry. We're going to measure NMR chemical shifts and then see if we can use computational chemistry uh, to sort them out. And so we'll begin by collecting isotropic chemical shifts on carbon and proton using HETCOR experiments, you know, at reasonably fast MAS. And then we'll measure the carbon chemical shift tensors uh, using two fairly well-known and well-established techniques. The first is this toss detoss experiment from Colbert and Griffin. This is uh, quite useful when you have relatively large chemical shift tensors. And then for the smaller chemical shift tensors, We'll measure them using CSA amplification experiment by Hong and Gang. And the, uh, this experiment um, amplifies the effect of CSA relative to the mass rate. And what's nice about it is it preserves the intensity of the sideband order. So I can still fit these using standard Hertzfeld Berger analysis. And for those of you who do this sort of analysis, right, what I'm showing in red is the, um, is the fit. And uh, in uh, black is the uh, experimental data. And that's the sort of tight, you know, agreement you should expect when you're doing uh, chemical shift tensor fits. And here it is again for the toss toss experiment. Okay, so from all of these experiments, we have a number of isotropic and tensor uh, chemical shift components. And that's requirement three, NMR restraints. Okay, um, our approach is going to be to try to use these restraints in a first principle screening. So we have these eight candidate crystal structures. We're going to calculate sh uh, shifts for each of these and then rank them by their agreement with the experiment. And to do this, of course, requires high precision first principles chemical shift calculations for solid state structures and a way to quantitatively rank these structures. And this is really, you know, the most essential component of NMR crystallography, right? Uh, we need um, we need to predict molecular properties, most importantly, chemical shifts, with high precision and accuracy. And so, for this, we turn to first principles computational chemistry. And then, second, we have to rank them uh, meaningfully. And for this, we can't ignore proper statistics. So we'll have a little crash course today on essential statistics for NMR crystallography. Okay, well, for the computational chemistry, uh, there's really two approaches to doing these sorts of calculations uh, that you'll find in the literature. The most common approach is to use plane wave-based methods uh, that are inherently periodic on the crystal lattice. And examples of this are Costa, Quantum Espresso, CPMD. Uh, these are really popular, but they do have a drawback in that it's computationally expensive to use hybrid functionals with these approaches. But let me just advertise for my colleague, Greg Barron. Uh, he has a really nice way uh, to solve this problem. Uh, so you can take a look at this paper. Uh, the second approach is a cluster fragment-based approach in which we build large clusters to mimic the solid state. And here we can use atom-centered Gaussian orbitals. So hybrid functionals are much more economical. That's good because the hybrid functionals are known to give better uh, chemical shift agreement. The challenge is convergence, right? We need to converge with respect to the extent of the system. So we need large clusters. Okay, so we use the second approach, this cluster-based approach um, using a hybrid many-body interaction fragment approach. And this was developed by my colleague, Greg Barron here at UCR. It's an efficient fragment-based approach that's intrinsically parallelizable and it allows us to build large clusters, you know, 30 plus angstroms to mimic the solid state. And one of the big selling features, again, is that we're using these atom-centered Gaussian orbitals so we can do DFT with hybrid functionals. And because of that,
it's highly accurate for NMR chemical shift calculations. In fact, Greg uh, and his student, and now uh, one of our colleagues here at UCR, Josh Hartman, have benchmarked <laughs> this approach with a series of calculations um, for a test set, comparing the predicted and the experimental chemical shifts uh, for a number of functionals. And the benchmarks also give the linear rescaling parameters that allow us to go back from the calculated shielding to a predicted um, chemical shift. And so these are uh, determined a priori, um, not, they're not adjustable parameters in our, uh, in our future analysis. And this is gonna be important because it's going to allow us not just to make relative comparisons of theory to experiment, but absolute comparisons. And what I mean by that is if we only used internally referenced uh, relative uh, chemical shifts, then in this example here, candidate one and candidate two would be equally good description of our target experimental data. But if we can do absolute referencing, then we can place these spectra on absolute scales, and then we see that candidate two right, is the accurate uh, description of the target data. Okay, if we look uh, in more detail at the residuals here uh, for the various uh, functionals, you'll see that these hybrids as advertised have root mean square deviations in the residuals of 1.4 ppm compared to two for the non-hybrid. So they're about a factor of root two better. Um, and within the sets, you no, know, they're all roughly equivalent. Okay, so I know a lot of uh, journal article ink has been used uh, arguing about whose uh, functional is better than whose. Um, but it really, from the standpoint of chemical shifts at least, it probably really doesn't matter, right? The differences are all washed out by this linear rescaling that we're doing. Now, this is probably not the case for calculating EFG tensors, okay? But that would be a different talk and a more qualified uh, speaker to talk on that subject. But for NMR chemical shifts, if you're doing linear rescaling a priori, these all work equally well for the hybrids, and they're a little bit better than the non-hybrids. Okay. Requirement four, accurate chemical shift prediction. We've got that. Okay, so regarding the accuracy of the chemical shift, let's have a, a little quiz now, okay? So uh, unfortunately, I don't have poll anywhere running, uh, so I'll, I'll guess your answers. But um, on this slide, there's two common types of statistics, right? There's a root mean square error listed over here, and there's R square, the Pearson correlation coefficient. So which of these can be, good, be used to assess the goodness of fit? Well, if you are paying attention earlier uh, to my side comments, or if you had the good fortune of having me as a reviewer for one of your articles, you'll definitely know the answer to this. And it's the root mean square error. Um, and here, an example is worth a thousand words. Okay, so what I'm showing here are three fits to align with increasing slope. And they all have the exact same residuals, right? I actually generated the residuals first and added them to the line. And then I did um, least squares fit in Mathematica and I determined the slope and uh, the standard errors for the extracted parameters. And of course the slope changes, but the standard error in the slope and the intercept you know, remains the same for all three of these. The RMSE, right? The root mean square errors of the residuals remains the same but the R squared changes dramatically, okay? And that's because R squared is not a measure of goodness of fit. What R squared is telling you is the fraction of the variation in the data that's explained by the model, in this case, a line. And so if the, if the slope increases, right, the residuals relative to the total extent of the change of the data is much larger and so it looks like you've explained more of the data in the R squared, right? And as the slope goes down, the R squared goes down, but that doesn't mean the fit is any worse, right? The fit is equivalently 
good in all of those cases. So, you know, R is just the correlation coefficient in the data. Uh, it's not a measure of the goodness of fit. On the other hand, the root mean square error is directly proportional to the error. And just to underline this, right, here's an example of comparing uh, two models, model one and model two with predicted shifts using R squared on the top and RMSE on the bottom, okay? And model one has a higher R squared than model two, yet the root mean square error of model one is higher than the root mean square for error two. So if you were to choose a model based on R squared, you know, which one's better, you'd choose model one, but you'd be completely wrong on that, right? Model two is the best description of those chemical shifts. And the reason this can happen is because, you know, R squared is always calculated relative to a correlation line, right? But what we want to do is compare the data, right? We want to look at, you know, what's the predicted shifts relative to the experimental shift. So we're always looking at the deviation from a line with a slope of one. Okay, I hope I've made my point. Uh, when we're going to test and rank for post-structural models, we're not going to use R squared. We're going to use um, the root mean squared error in the form of the reduced chi-squared. And so this is the squared deviation between the predicted model shifts and the experimental shifts weighted by the root mean square error from the benchmark studies. And this statistic will actually help us place confidence limits on our models. So if we have individual chemical shift points that are being predicted that satisfy a normal distribution relative to you know, the true value. So if each one of the data points we pick um, is picked from this distribution, then, um, then our chi-squared statistic has a characteristic distribution called the chi-squared distribution that takes into account that sometimes when we're doing this picking, we're going to get lucky and add up close to, you know, a deviation of zero from the mean. Other times we'll be unlucky and fall out here. And if I'm picking three points, it's much more likely that I could be lucky sometimes and get a really small reduced chi-squared. And other times I'm just really unlucky and I end up here three times. Uh, and so the shape of this distribution is gonna depend on how many points I pick. For um, uh, As I pick more and more points, right, it should become tighter and tighter because you know, the chance of picking 200 points and always being lucky you know, is much smaller um, than in the case where I'm just picking three. Okay. And so we can use this distribution to say whether a model uh, is consistent with the experimental data. So for example, if you have a model that has predictions for 10 experimental shifts, and each one of those shifts has a prediction error equal to the root mean square error of the test set, then 95 out of 100 times, you know, a correct model will have a reduced chi-squared less than 1.83. And if the model has a reduced chi-squared greater than 1.83, then you can reject it with greater than 95% confidence. And the only assumption that goes into this sort of statistic is that our underlying um, uh, distribution for the errors in that initial linear rescaling is normal. And so you'll want to test that. And so here I've taken those residuals, I've made a histogram of them, and to tell if it's normal, um, you know, you can just visually inspect it. Is it unimodal and roughly symmetric? That's good. If you want to be uh, more careful about it, you can compare the cumulative distribution function for your residuals versus that expected for a normal distribution. And this is called a probability plot, and it should be roughly linear, uh, which it is. So check, we're good to go. And we have our uh, final component for NMR crystallography. We have a way to quantitatively rank our models. Okay, so let's get back to the identity of the solid state reacted dimer. We have a series of candidate structures, and we calculate their chemical shifts and compare them to the experimental shifts, ranking them with this reduced chi-squared statistic. And we're combining 
everything we measure uh, spectroscopically. So because these weights are determined by the benchmarks, I can include in this reduced chi-squared my proton isotropic shifts, my carbon isotropic shifts, and my tensor components, as long as I weight them by their corresponding root mean square errors. And then I can look at the uh, various NMR parameters separately, uh, or I can just combine them into this overall reduced chi-squared statistic. And when I do that, um, I can rule out these structures with the large torsions for the ester groups. And the best description uh, has space group PCCN, uh, but these other space groups you know, show essentially equivalent results. And that's good because if you really look at those structures, they're not really that different from each other, right? They differ subtly in the ester torsion of the T-butyl rotations uh, and the T-butyl rotations. And at room temperature, we're probably rotating through all of them. And so I'm going to concentrate on this PCCN structure um, in the rest of the talk. But if I were to pick one of the other structures, it wouldn't change the conclusions at all. And if we uh, compare the unit cells and the packing for this solid state reactive dimer that we determined compared to the monomer, what we see is that it maintains the herringbone packing of the anthracene rings and the turk butyl ester groups are still rotated inward, just like the monomer. And this is consistent with the topochemical principles, right? We react, these two anthracene rings pull together, yet there isn't uh, room or time for much else to happen. So the ester groups remain in their original positions. And so this is satisfying as a description of what happens, but unfortunately it doesn't provide any obvious mechanism for the expansion because the volume per anthracene ring for the solid state reactive dimer is actually slightly smaller than that for the monomer. Again, as you might expect, you're contracting things. And so if we were hoping that a bulk volume change to the unit cell would explain our expansion, that just turns out to be too naive. And so to determine the mechanism of the expansion, we actually need to orient the monomer and the dimer unit cells relative to the nanorod axis. And we'll do this by direct NMR measurements on an ensemble of oriented single crystal nanorods that we just leave in these AAO templates. And then we slide them into a flat coil NMR probe shown here so that the nanorod axes are aligned along the static magnetic field. And so this gives us one degree of orientation. Uh, but as we know in other contexts in NMR like oriented bilayers, one axis of alignment can give beautifully sharp spectra uh, as long as that axis of alignment is the magnetic field direction. Now, sensitivity is going to be challenging in these experiments. And so we prepared the nine terputyl anthracene ester C13 labeled on this T-butyl group. Um, and this is the NMR spectrum of a single crystal, uh, a single bulk crystal, so not the nanorods. And the spectrum is consistent with rapid rotation of this terp-butyl group about this oxygen-carbon bond. And that gives three methyls that are magnetically equivalent, and it substantially simplifies the spectrum. And we just see an average dipolar coupling along that rotation axis with a roughly one to three to three to one um, intensity pattern for this center carbon coupled to these methyls. Now, because there's two alignments or two orientations of the asymmetric unit with respect to the magnetic field, we actually see two different chemical shifts for that central carbon um, and two different dipolar couplings to the methyls. Okay, so similarly, we can look at the oriented monomer and dimer nanorods. And all things considered, these are still pretty nice uh, spectra. You know, clearly, we've lost some resolution, but we see a nice clear transition as we irradiate the crystals and go from the monomer to the solid state reacted dimer. And we can actually look at progressive periods of illumination, and we see a depletion of the monomer and the formation of the solid state reacted dimer. And there's a nice isobestic point, so it's consistent with a, a two site reaction model. Okay, so to orient the unit cells, uh, we're going to make use of the chemical shielding tensors and their alignment relative to the crystal unit cell that we already calculated um, 
using first principles. And so we can predict what these spectra would look like as a function of the orientation of the unit cell, you know, parameterized here by rotations about the beta and gamma Euler angles. And these show some really interesting patterns. And to figure out our orientation, it's just a simple matter of matching these predicted uh, spectra to the experimental data. But before I do that, I, I want to put in a shameless plug for our software package tensor view that makes it easy to display these tensors on the molecular framework. And for those of you who still think of your tensors as ellipsoids, I'm happy to disabuse you. Uh, these are what they actually look like. The shape is, is far more interesting. Uh, you can download TensorView to run either in Mathematica, and then recently with Leo Svenigsen, we wrote a MATLAB version uh, which runs without a license. And so you can uh, download these and use these. They're also, a, uh, the MATLAB version is also available on NMR Box. And also, if you are doing these sorts of rotations, I'd really suggest sticking with the Cartesian form of the rotation. Um, if you're gonna use spherical tensors, you'll want to check out my Concepts and Magnetic Resonance article from back in 2011, as well as this ENC, actually two ENC tutorials, which are available online, uh, because you'll want to see why you actually have to um, use the Wigner rotation matrix elements for the inverse rotation to find consistency between the rotation matrix that you apply to your molecular coordinates and those that rotate uh, the spherical tensors. And this could be a tutorial on its own and has been in the past. Okay, with these tools, however, again, we can go back to the question of the orientation. We just have to match our experimental spectrum up uh, to one of these orientations. And when we do that, uh, what we learn is that the monomer is oriented with its 100 plane perpendicular to the nanorod axis, and the solid state reacted dimer is oriented with its 012 plane perpendicular. And then with these orientations established relative to the nanorod axis, we can actually just measure the expansion directly from equivalent molecular points, um, which give a predicted expansion based on the NMR alignment of 7.4% compared to the experimental expansion of 8%. And so we call that pretty good agreement. As to the underlying mechanism, uh, taking a slightly different perspective, you can see that the expansion is due to the formation of these sp3 carbons, which causes the anthracene rings to pucker and push the herringbone layers apart. Um, the net expansion axis turns out to be along the diagonal of the AC crystal plane. Uh, so it's critical to understand the expansion of the nanorods to know how that expansion axis is oriented relative to the nanorod axis. And so let me finish up this part um, of the talk with both a conclusion and uh, a challenge. So NMR-assisted crystallography can indeed establish the atomic level basis for the macroscopic expansion. Uh, but to do so, you have to determine both the unit cells as well as their orientations relative uh, to the shape change. And for the challenge, now that we know the atomic level expansion axis, now can we tailor uh, the initial orientation of the unit cells relative to the nanorod in order to engineer custom expansions. And people are indeed trying to work at methods like molecular lathes to do just that. Okay, so I know I haven't left myself uh, much time, but I also do wanna give you a flavor for how we're using NMR crystallography in a very different system, which is the enzyme active site of tryptophan synthase. So I'll be quick about this and just give you a broad overview. Uh, but in this case, our goal is to understand the en enzymatic transformation of substrate to product at the atomic level. That is, we want to understand how every atom is moving, including the hydrogens. And so to accomplish this, again, we're going to use this integrated combination of techniques that span different length scales and have some advantages and some drawbacks 
for characterizing the chemical transformations that are taking place in the enzyme active site. So for example, you know, X-ray diffraction um, gives outstanding global structural information. It tells us about the proximity of acid base groups to the active site, um, but it comes without hydrogen atoms. And if you're trying to understand acid-base catalysis in an enzyme, that's a real drawback. Um, NMR can provide chemical shifts for selected atoms of the enzyme substrate complex, but unless we have a larger structural framework to interpret those, we can only make empirical correlations of shift with structure. Um, computational chemistry, both first principles and molecular dynamics can build models for enzymatic processes, but they rely on chemical level details that you have to specify. Uh, together though, uh, these techniques can provide consistent and testable models. We can use the X-ray diffraction um, to provide a coarse framework, and then we can build models on that framework using computational chemistry. We're free to explore whatever crazy chemistry we think is going on in the active site. We can make multiple models of that, and then we can test those models uh, by how well their first principles predicted shifts reproduce uh, the experimental chemical shifts measured with solid state NMR. Okay, um, so very briefly, um, again, we have an interesting target system. In this case, it's an enzyme, tryptophan synthase. It's a 143 kilodalton bienzyme complex that catalyzes the last two steps in the biosynthesis of L-tryptophan, and its beta subunit cofactor is pyridoxal 5 prime phosphate. And this defines a large class of enzymes that are involved in amino acid metabolism. And, um, and where the hydrogens are, are of course unknown. And so the challenge um, in this case to NMR crystallography is can we determine those protonation states and what can those tell us about the mechanism in tryptophan synthase and the inhibition of complexes. In other words, can NMR crystallography take these bare structures that we get from X-ray crystallography and give them this chemically rich detail? Okay, so again, uh, we're going to need a structural framework. So our starting point is X-ray crystal structures. That's a requirement that we hope to relax in the future. Uh, but for now, working with our collaborators, we've solved a number of X-ray crystal structures uh, for various enzymatic intermediates in tryptophan synthase at reasonably good resolution. After we have a starting point for the structure, we need NMR chemical shift restraints. So we prepare microcrystals of the enzyme for solid state NMR under analogous conditions to those used to prepare the single crystal for X-ray. And then we make use of labeled protein, labeled cofactor, labeled substrates, to establish steady state concentrations of these intermediates in the catalytically active enzyme. And that's critical. These things are catalytically active. They're turning over substrate to product in our MAS rotors as we're doing our experiments. And we can actually observe what's happening in the um, mother liquor by using solution state, you know, weak uh, decoupling. So single pulse excitation, weak decoupling. And then we can interleave those with CPMAS experiments, which selectively look at the bound substrates. And so we can go off to the spectrometer and measure chemical shifts on the cofactor, on the substrate, and some of the surrounding protein residues. Once we have those, uh, we have to put the chemistry of the active site in context. And for that, we turn to first principles computational chemistry. And so what we're doing here is we're using a cluster model approach. We dig out this enzyme active site, so all residues within seven angstroms of the cofactor and substrate. We fix the exterior of this cluster at the crystallographic coordinates and then do fully quantum mechanical geometry optimizations and chemical shift predictions for the interior. Now I've already uh, noted how good the agreement uh, should be between the predicted shifts uh, and the experimental shifts. Okay, so again, we can um, we can come up with um, a bunch of different models. In this case, what we're doing 
is we're changing the protonation states throughout the active site. So there's seven ionizable groups. <clears throat> we form all two to the seventh possible structures. We put them in these clusters. We geometry optimize them. Um, we use a lot of CPU time on the cluster. And then we rank these models. And uh, again, we can refine the models, being careful about the statistics. What do we learn in the end from these? Uh, well, what we learned about is chemistry, right? We take these bare structures from crystallography and we give them, um, we give them this chemistry, chemically rich detail. And through this, the chemistry really comes into focus. So for instance, for this particular intermediate, what we see when we add the hydrogens is that the central water is aligned perfectly along the reaction coordinate for the loss of the serine substrate beta hydroxyl um, and, the, um, and it's leaving as a water. So if we take one step back in the mechanism, uh, what we're seeing is that this lysine side chain would be charged and our substrate carbon uh, oxygen bond is intact. And then this proton transfers to the beta hydroxyl and it leaves as water to find this initial binding pocket. And it's the imprint of this mechanistic step that we're actually able to see with NMR-assisted crystallography. Okay, I know that was a brief introduction into what we were doing in, um, in biomolecular systems, but let me uh, stop there and conclude by saying, you know, when we started this work in proteins, we thought it was going to be about structure. But now we think it's going to play an equally important role in characterizing dynamics, but not just dynamics, I mean chemical dynamics, reactivity. Um, and that's, you know, when you think about it, chemistry has always been uh, one of NMR's um, strongest points. And I think that's where it's going to um, interface most strongly with the other tools of structural biology, like X-ray crystallography, cryo-EM, and even neutron crystallography. Okay. Well, with that, uh, let me uh, thank my, uh, my group members and my collaborators, uh, especially Riddick and Jacob, who did the bulk of the work on the biomolecular NMR crystallography, even though I didn't have time to talk in great detail about that work. And then uh, Ryan Kudla, Chen Yang, and Kevin Chalik on the uh, 90 BAE um, nanorods. And with that, um, I'd like to thank you again for the kind invitation, and I would be very happy to take questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Miller. That was a great talk. Um, it was very informative, and I, I, I'm sure uh, many of us will go back and rewatch parts of that once the video is live online. Um, so we have a few questions already. We have a question from David Bryce. He asks, hey, he's, he says, excellent stuff, Len. Do you know whether the RMSD is used as cutoffs for 13C, 15N, and 17O uh, chemical shift agreement reflects some inherent difficulty in calculating shifts for nitrogen and oxygen, or is the RMSD perhaps somehow proportional to the overall chemical shift range? Um, I'm not sure that those are different answers. So, um, First off, I wish Greg Barron were here because I would ask him to comment on that. Right, the the challenge becomes um, becomes all the non-bonding electrons, and I think they're more challenging to describe, and they also make the chemical shift, you know, larger. Um, so, so for um, so I think that is part of it. You definitely have to make larger clusters if you're going to converge those shifts because they're more sensitive uh, overall. And so I, I think those are just various ways of saying the same thing, right? You have the non-bonding electrons, uh, the more polarizable, you have to describe things better. They also give it a, a larger chemical shift range. And so our ability to predict them is, is not as good. So I don't know if that answers your question. Hope it does. Hopefully that answers David's question. Um, so uh, I had a, yes, he says, thank you. 
Uh, so I, I was wondering, uh, what are the what are the practical limits on uh, the unit cell size um, that that you can that you can access in in a in a in a practical way, or the number of atoms per unit unit yeah. cell to to accurately predict chemical shifts? So, um, you know, for carbon, what we found, and I say we, but I really mean my colleague Greg Barron uh, and and my other colleague, Josh Harman, what they found is if you look at the extent of the crystal size, and we've done this with our protein systems with them, you know, carbon is converged by the time you get out like four angstroms easily. Um, so going farther than that, unnecessary for carbon. Nitrogen, you've got to go farther. Oxygen, you have to go even farther, like seven angstroms. Um, so if you're looking just at a central region, like we are in the proteins, then you need to get your, your clusters out that far. Um, if you're doing, um, if you're doing um, unit cells and you have shifts throughout the whole unit cell, you'd wanna build off farther than that um, if you're doing a cluster approach, right? If you're doing a plane wave approach, then, well, you already have that extent sort of built into it. Uh, but if you're asking a different question, which is how big of a unit cell can you handle these days? Uh, I would say it's it's a great time to be doing this because the computational power is just incredible. So things that used to take us weeks now take us days. And um, we have uh, cloud resources now with, with um, you know, 10,000 CPU cores. So things that we used to think, oh, this would take us two years to do, we can do in, in a week. So uh, it's a great time to be doing this. So don't be afraid of large systems is what I would say. The resources are there to do those now. It's good to know. All right. Uh, so if anyone else has any questions, please feel free to enter them into the Q&A. Um, we have a question from Patrick Vanderwell. Great talk. Have you ever dealt with molecular motion impacting the chemical shift calculations such that you have to average chemical shifts for a range of structures or states? Yeah, that's a great, that's a really great question. Uh, thanks for asking that, Patrick. So there's um, two parts to this, right? The linear, part of why linear rescaling, you know, or part of what linear rescaling does for you is remove the effect of all that fast averaging, right? So we, we take predicted chemical shifts for a ground state structure, right? Single static structure. And we map those onto experimental shifts in the linear rescaling. Now, if there's fast vibrational motions or standard motions, that's taken into account in that mapping. And provided that what we apply that to has the same sort of motions, well, then we can ignore it. On the other hand, if you have, you know, things on a chemical exchange time scale, you absolutely have to take those into account. And we see that quite often in our enzyme active sites. So I didn't go into the details, but for you know, our intermediates, we often find that there's an equilibrium, a tautomeric exchange between protonation at the shift-based nitrogen and across a hydrogen bond to the cofactor oxygen. And we definitely have to take those into account. And so, um, the trick, you know, the tricky part is then you're introducing, you know, degrees of freedom, um, or you're lowering, um, you're inc you're increasing uh, variability, and you might expect you're going to have many more structures that would agree with the experimental data once you allow structures to start averaging. And so you need to measure more chemical shift restraints. You'll definitely want to do things like measure tensors, which are very sensitive to exchange because they're averaging not just in magnitude, but in orientation. So if you have exchange happening, you can sort it out. So if you have these large scale motions, absolutely. Uh, but it takes more, uh, more chemical shift parameters to be measured to do this in a unique fashion. Great, I think that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, so I would uh, invite people to keep asking questions um, as long as uh, Professor Muller is happy to keep answering them. Um, so uh, you mentioned uh, you mentioned at some point calculating uh, EFG tensors. Um, is that is that uh, more more computationally expensive if you want to calculate EFG tensors um, it, and include include that? So. Um, 
we have only done a very limited amount of that. And so I think there's probably other folks who could speak on that with much greater authority. In my experience, it's more challenging. Uh, often you're dealing with um, you know, uh, elements that are down several ro rows in the periodic table. And so it gets, it gets much more challenging. So, um, and you're also very much more sensitive to you know, the electrostatic environment. So, which is a good thing, but also uh, can be a challenge. And I know um, uh, Rob Shurko has done some really nice work on this uh, as well as other groups. And so I would probably defer to them on that. Sure, all right. Well, it doesn't look like we have any more questions. Um, at least no more have been entered into the Q&A that I can see. Ah, we have one from an anonymous attendee who asks, when you see that R squared is not a good fit, do you use any other method apart from chi squared? Uh, oh. Like, like oh. KNN or unsupervised supervised learning? Yeah, so the answer is um, no. Uh, you know, we, well, not entirely no. So, so the, um, so we usually stick with, with uh, the reduced chi squared, but you can take, you know, all these tests are sort of, there's a whole series of related tests, right? If you want to compare, say, two models, right, you get two reduced chi-squares, you know, one might be at the 90% confident limit, and you say it's good, the other one might be at 97, and you reject it, and then you can ask, you know, is the one at 90 really that different from the one at 97? And so you can compare those two reduced chi-squares in, in an F statistic, right? And what the F statistics does, it's, it says, okay, let's say I'm picking 10, randomly 10 points from that initial Gaussian distribution. I calculate the reduced chi-squared for those. And then I pick another 10, which is you know, my alternate model. I calculate its reduced chi-squared and I take their ratio. And you can ask, well, for you know, two sets of 10 picks, how should that ratio be distributed? And that's the F distribution. And so you can put confidence limits on the difference between two models using the F distribution. And so we do that. We usually do that to get um, relative. Let me share my screen again. So here's that F distribution that I just told you about, right? That tells you, you know, what does that ratio look like? And again, you can put cutoffs to say, okay, with 95% confidence, this model is better than that model. But you can also use that to get relative probabilities for all the models you consider. So if you, you know, like in the, in the uh, 90 BAE, I had all those models that looked essentially the same. And so I would ascribe them all equal probabilities uh, whereas those other models that were far outside, they would get much smaller probabilities. And then you can use those in a, a Bayesian analysis. And this is something that Lyndon uh, really introduced to NMR crystallography. But you can ask a question, okay, what's my absolute certainty of, you know, of this final model I have being the experimental model? And so you can use... Bayesian analysis to do that sort. So we've done things like that. But after that, we haven't done what I would consider uh, more advanced statistics. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. Thank you. Uh, we have a question, <clears throat> a question in the chat. Um, you mentioned that you use shielding and shift regression from your benchmark calculations. Are there any situations where the same regression wouldn't apply to your new calculations? And how careful do you have to be about using the exact same parameters? Yeah, good question. So you really want to be really careful about that, right? So um, so you want, um, you know, your level in our experience, and others can chime in if they have different experience, in our experience, you need a good structure. It doesn't matter how you calculate that good structure, right? So you could calculate it with plane wave, plane wave methods, get a really good structure and pull that out for chemical shift calculations in a cluster. So you need a good structure. Doesn't seem to be too sensitive to how you get the good structure. After that, right, your level of theory and basis set do matter, right? So you want to um, use the same level of theory and basis set and you want to make sure that your cluster is large enough that you've converged the shift. If you do that, 
um, you should expect that you can apply that linear rescaling to your new system. Um, if you can't, if something seems to be wrong, I wouldn't look to the linear rescaling. I would look to something else in your system, you know, something that you haven't converged with respect to extent or maybe the structure, uh, there's something wrong with the structure. So, um, so in our experience, you can provided your system is large enough that you've converged the shifts, but you do have to use, the linear rescalings are absolutely dependent on the basis set and level of theory. Um, so as you change functionals, they change uh, a bit and uh, you want to be careful about that. 